So we are now recording. We are having more and more people enter, which is just great. So as you enter, welcome, welcome to you all. So some of the, uh, some of what we do is um, we request that everyone have uh, as much as possible, have your camera on so we can um, see each other and that you have your screens on the gallery view when we aren't um, screen sharing so we can see more, uh, more faces. I am Rhea Markowitz and I am uh, from the Georgia Cancer Center and part of the teledermatology in, um, Rural, in, in rural Georgia, um, part of the hub team. And I will be serving as a co-facilitator of today's session along with uh, Dr. Doug Patton. So I want to welcome uh, some new people uh, who are joining us. We have um, some residents and I think uh, possibly faculty from AU's Department of Family Medicine, and they will be joining us for. Um... Hi guys, we're out of sight of the, of the camera and some of us are online as well. Okay, well, it's great. It's great to have you. Um, it's great to have you here. So we want to welcome our regular um, folks. And when, when I mention your category of who you are, if you could um, just wave a little. So we've got our um, participants from the Teladerm clinics that we serve. If those of you here can, can wave hello. Okay. And we have our, um, our dermatology team here from AU and there, I'm not sure if there are any uh, students or residents uh, from the dermatology team, but if you guys can say hello. And um, our, uh, our other members of our administrative members of the team, Marsal, me, and um, other, you know, other team members for Teladerm. We are all here. There might be some nurses from AU on board. If there are, wave and say, say hello. So uh, in order to get to know each other and keep track of everything, we would like you to put, go into the chat and put your name, your email address and your affiliation. So if you're from one of the clinics or if you're a family medicine person uh, and so forth, uh, indicate that into the chat. So now, uh, if I can have, I guess I can share. No, Marcel, can you share my screen? Okay. Um, and I want to make sure you all know that um, Marcel is, um, is at the controls um, with me. We are a bit short staffed today, so hopefully everything will go well, but um, uh, members of our team who aren't here are uh, Kenza Mamuni, who's normally here, but she's on vacation and actually on her honeymoon, and um, Claudia Guillen, who has been our uh, program coordinator. Uh, she is beginning her medical residency today up in Chicago, and so she's no longer on board with us and her replacement has not yet started. And I don't know if, if, if Brenda, is Brenda on board? I haven't seen her name, but I'm not sure uh, her, our new project manager is uh, uh, hopefully coming, hopefully we'll be here by the next uh, tele-echo. So uh, let me review uh, our agenda for today. We've had our introduction. And we will uh, then go into, or we'll have part of the introduction. We'll then go into the didactic presentation by Dr. Kendall Buchanan, which will be about the two-step dermoscopy algorithm. 
And then Dr. Sam Walling um, from one of our clinics will present the, uh, the first of two case presentations today. And then Dr. Jeremy Greer will present the second one. Uh, Jeremy has been with us from the start as we wrote the grant for this project. And this will be his last um, session as a participating member of uh, Teladerm as he moves up to a new position in dermatology in Tennessee. So he'll give the uh, second case presentation and then we'll have a wrap up with uh, announcements. So let me see, what else do I need? To, uh, to mention. Those of you who uh, want CME, CNE day, uh, credit, um, Marsol will put the uh, code uh, at, the end of the, um, at the end of the presentation. And um, so you'll be able to uh, make sure you uh, get that credit. And now I think I can introduce, turn the program over to Dr. Doug Patton who will, who will um, continue with us. Uh, Doug is the Dean of MCG Southwest Regional Campus uh, and has spent most of his career as a rural physician. So Doug, take it away. Thank you, Rhea. It's, a, it's good to be back with everyone again today and uh, looking forward to a really great presentation um, from Dr. Buchanan and also Dr. Whaling uh, and Dr. Greer uh, in, his, in his final performance with us. So uh, I'm not sure we can forgive you for leaving and going to Tennessee, but we'll do our best, Jeremy. Uh, just a couple of things as reminders. Uh, we always like to make sure that everyone, even the new people, kind of understand the platform and why we're using this platform for this. We use Project Echo uh, as a platform for uh, education sharing stands for Extension for Community Health Outcomes, and the motto is moving knowledge instead of people. Next slide. Next slide, please. So it's a collaborative med medical education model uh, that is designed to enhance the capacity of rural and underserved area providers, uh, providers who are not necessarily part of an academic medical center to be able to expand their scope of service through education and confidence building. Uh, and we do this by creating these learning loops between specialists and frontline clinicians. And it's really designed to help you provide more care for your patients and better care for your patients closer to home and allow you to build on the skill set that we know that you already have. It's, to be clear, this is not a consultative service and we don't, through Project ECHO, we don't provide care directly to patients. Um, and of course, you can go to the echo.universityofnewmexico.edu. That's echo.unm.edu if you want more information about Project ECHO. Next slide, please. So again, this project is designed specifically to improve your knowledge and competency around teledermoscopy and teledermatology to help you at the local level uh, through a distance learning model to help people, to help you solve problems closer to home, uh, to avoid unnecessary travel and consultations uh, away from your site uh, where we can help you provide that care directly to the people that you serve, primarily in these rural areas around the state. Next slide, please. Just remember that these sessions are recorded. Um, by participating in this, you've had to click through the consent to be recorded. Um, and as a reminder, because this is not a consultative service, uh, it's educational only, please don't mention any PHI in the discussions. Uh, there will be information in the end, uh, towards the end about the CME and CNE credits and how you get there. Um, uh, there's always the opportunity to email us uh, or put questions in at the chat. Um, and as always, we're always soliciting feedback on how to make these sessions better for you. Um, a key piece of that, obviously, is to solicit your engagement and have you involved in that, which is why we're grateful, particularly today, to have a case presentation by one of our participants. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Next slide. 
So we use the data, everything from registration all the way through chat comments and responses to questions and things like that uh, to help improve the program. These, this data is kept confidential, um, but it will be used by us and by Project ECHO as a whole to help improve uh, the function and the effectiveness of these programs. Next slide, please. So just some general Zoom reminders. Uh, again, uh, mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Unmute when it is time to speak. <clears throat> you can ask questions in the chat or when we get to the end of a segment, whether it's the end of Dr. Buchanan's presentation, um, you can put those questions in the chat anytime. But when we get to the end, if you have a question that you would like to ask out loud, you can raise your electronic hand. Again, that's done by hovering your cursor over the bottom part of your screen. I'll look for the reactions button hover over that and you'll see a raised hand icon pop up. Um, the, um, we'll call on folks in order as best we can. Um, keep your camera pointed so your face is visible and not like this. Keep it on uh, so that we can see everybody as much as possible. We do understand that sometimes broadband limitations keep you from being able to do that. Um, again, you can uh, put technical issues in the chat, or you can e email Marisol at mgalvis, M-G-A-L-V-I-S at augusta.edu if you're having problems. Next slide. Okay, I think with that, unless anyone has any questions or concerns, or there's something that uh, I don't see anything popping up in the chat, but with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kendall Buchanan as our featured speaker. She is part of the Department of Dermatology and practices at AU's Care Center for Dermatology over in Aiken, South Carolina. Today, she's gonna share some information with us about two-step dermoscopy algorithms. And the presentation will last for roughly 20 minutes or so. And then we'll have some time afterwards for questions. Um, it, as always, you can put your questions in the chat at any point along the way, or we'll have a few minutes for open conversation at the end of her presentation. With that, Dr. Buchanan, thank you for joining us today and for preparing this presentation. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Let me... I'm trying to share my screen. I'm glad I'm not the only one who is still having trouble finding buttons sometimes. So. Let's see, sorry. It's all right. Mm -hmm. Try it again. Um, I'm working on it, sorry. It's all right, take your time. She's doing that. Let me just say that we have a great list of participants uh, today. I see that we've got some um, medical student or two, and we've got um, the group from family medicine and um, a couple nurses on board here, um, not, from, uh, not from the clinics. Um, and of course, um, people from all of the, the Teladerm uh, clinics. So this is, uh, uh, this is a great turnout. <laughs> About Sorry, guys, I just got this computer and I have it's it's like does anyone sorry it's it's basically saying that if you, if Rhea, you Rhea, have, have y'all given her the permission to share her screen? Yeah. She need that? yeah, she's been made a 
she's a co-host, right? Okay, because it's if I try and do it, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I just want to make sure she's able to do that. Um, okay, Kendall, sometimes you have to put the lecture on the desktop, and then when you share a screen, it'll come up the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, I have it open on. Um, oh, hold on. Well, if you want to email it to us, we could, we can put it up. Okay. You can't. Can you see it now? Sorry. No. 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 I can email it to you. Um, it's just kind of a larger file, but I'm sorry. You want to see if I have a copy of it as well? Well, I kind of, I, I redid it. Let me. Um, you can put it I'll in email, the box. I'll email it to you, Raya. I don't know if, would it be beneficial for the, the um, maybe one case to go ahead and be presented because I don't I know everyone's time is valuable um you want to do that Sam do you want to uh... it's great Sam are you are you okay with going ahead I'm I'm available I can do it that's yes, right and you're sharing you're doing your own share screen correct yes ma'am okay let's see if I can get it You guys need to have some like teenagers always on standby for these technical issues. Yeah. <laughs> and I, here, I'm going to mute myself. Can you all see my screen? We can. Great. Um, just to introduce myself. Uh, I am a community physician uh, down in Albany, Georgia uh, at Lee Medical Arts. Um, I am part of the Southwest campus. Um, so I've been, had the privilege to work with Doug Patton and um, also um, Dr. Rabinovitz and everybody else on the team on this. Um, I just wanna say again, um, how, how great of a project um, this is. Uh, it's been able to bring uh, my patients who normally would not be able to walk into a dermatologist's office just because of the copay, um, be able to see the gravity of, you know, potential lesion and convince them to like, hey, you know, like we really need to do something about this and uh, get it taken care of. Um, just being able to get the picture and get the feedback and tell them what what the uh, lesion is. Um, so thank you once again. Um, I appreciate it. Um, and I also want to thank Dr. Benevitz for helping me make this uh, slide set. Um, he did a great job. And uh, I, I also want to point out that um, I graduated residency a few years ago. Um, I was introduced to the two-step um, algorithm, um, but didn't didn't exercise any of in, in any of it. And um, you know, in the midst of my busy practice now, um, this has been made a possibility for me to learn. You guys, you know, bringing it to me, helping uh, me understand it helping me be able to participate in this. Um, so you're making it very easy. So I appreciate that. Uh, the case that I have today um, came from a 39 year old uh, male who came with two raised uh, brown papules on his back, um, one a little bit higher than the other. Um, you know, his concern coming in is, is this malignancy. Um, this was his chief complaint for the visit. Um, these weren't any new lesions, and they had been there for more than three months. Um, you know, there had been no change in color, size, or shape, um, and there was no personal or 
um, family history of cancer. Um, I was thinking that these were most likely hemangioma or a nevus, um, and I wasn't sure at the time if a biopsy was needed. So this is the inferior lesion, um, as you can tell from the picture on the bottom right. And then looking at the dermoscopic um, picture on the left, um, we note the multiple globules and then the vessels that we can say look like comma-shaped vessels. And then branching into our two-step diagnostic algorithm, we first want to determine whether it's a, a melanocytic or non-melanocytic uh, lesion. Um, melanocytic lesions either have a network, globules, streaks, or homogeneous blue. Um, this one, like we said in the previous slide, has globules. And so looking at the colors next, um, you know, the types of colors that we could see in these situations uh, based off of these, that box on the left side of the screen, black, brown, gray, blue, red, white, yellow. Um, looking at our lesion, you know, we see a light brown, dark brown and red. And, um, you know, most common colors being a light brown, dark brown and black. Um, and then also noting that, you know, benign lesions usually have three or less colors to them. So that would be our lesion that we have here. Um, and so benign versus malignant, malignants potentially see more than you know, three or more colors. Uh, symmetry uh, refers to the distribution of colors and structures on either side of the axis and not the shape of the lesion. So we have a symmetric pattern here, um, separating it into four quadrants. Organization uh, refers to uniformity of structure and their distribution in specific locations as seen in benign patterns. Um, so we see that as well here um, with the distribution of our structures. Um, and because of that, um, a benign, considering that this would uh, be a benign lesion, a biopsy wouldn't be indicated and um, the patient could be informed that we can follow this up in six months and you know, take another picture. So the second lesion is the more superior lesion and this lesion really we're just kind of driving home what we learned in the first one. So. Um, as you can see, we have examples of more globules and more comma-shaped vessels. And then um, the globules also um, having the cobblestone pattern, uh, creating a cobblestone pattern. So here's our two-step algorithm again, um, considering that melanocytic lesions, you know, they can be have a network, globules, streaks, and uh, or homogeneous blue. And um, the R's have globules again. Um, our colors slide, you know, we're seeing uh, light brown or tan, dark brown and red. Um, so uh, there again, um, benign lesions have three or less colors. Malignant lesions generally have more than three colors. Um, here's our sym symmetry slide. So we have uh, the distribution of our colors and structures and symmetric pattern, and then um, organization referring to uniformity and their distribution. Um, so there again, uh, for this lesion as well, we would not need to have um, a biopsy given it's given it most likely being a benign lesion based on the um, structures that we saw and commented on. So um, in summary, um, you know, obviously we're going to approach all of our cases with the two-step algorithm and the decision-making process. Um, then we get to distinguish between the melanocytic versus non-melanocytic lesions. Um, and we help separate benign lesions from 
malignant neoplasms by symmetry, asymmetry, organization, or disorganization, and the number of colors. Are there any questions? That is all that I have. Thanks, Dr. Welling. That's terrific and very well organized. And um, thank you, Dr. Rabinovitz, for uh, providing some assistance to him. Any questions? I don't see any hands raised right now. I don't see anything in the chat. Wait a minute. We do have a question from the AU Department of Family Medicine. Hi there. <laughs> Sorry about that. We we lost connection for 30 seconds of that. So did you determine that that was benign or or not benign? Yes, both uh, the superior and the inferior lesions were uh, determined to be benign. Um, and I did not take biopsies to confirm that. Okay. And our other question was about symmetry. So you said Symmetry refers to not the shape, but when you draw a line down the axis, you compare the, the distribution between the sides. So we were just thinking that first one did not seem symmetric, but we missed the whole part there. Um, the first one, let me go back. So I think mm -hmm. this was the second one. And I'm, right. are, you guys can see me scrolling through my... Yes, yes. yes. Okay, great. It was so, this one, this, yeah. this one, right? Okay. Uh, you know, looking at the globules, and, and please, I'm, I'm just speaking from my experience with this case, so I'm looking for maybe some comments from people who've been doing this for a while, but if I were to take a stab at it, um, it would be noticing that the globules and the cobblestone pattern would be appreciated in the four quadrants, and then also seeing the comma shape um vessels as well um obviously we have our our shape but obviously it's not determined on that but i would like to hear comment from somebody else dr rabinovitz are you where you sure. can hear yeah, so, so, yeah, right. so so basically when we're talking about you know, some, some, some symmetry and pattern we're talking about the pattern throughout and nothing is a hundred percent perfect in pattern that is, there's no such thing as a true Adonis. There's always a little blip where you might have some globules that aren't perfectly symmetrical in shape. But if you look at this pattern, it's throughout the same. The colors are the same. The vasculature is, for the most part, the same. Okay? There are no what we call melanoma-specific features. And this is a pattern that is a repetitive pattern, which you'll see over and over again with a congenital nevus intradermal type. The pattern very similar in the next lesion as well. If you cut it in half, it's not an exact mirror image, but the structures and the vasculature in this one as well is a pattern that you see relatively throughout. So these are not 100% um, perfect in symmetry, but again, based on what we're seeing, the globules, the vessels, which are slightly curved, uh, which are known as comma vessels. Again, it's a pattern diagnosis. Thank you. Thanks for the question, because it is a little bit hard to know exactly what's been. Obviously, they don't look exactly uniform in all four quadrants, but what we're looking for here is the, is the pattern recognition. All right, any other questions? Dr. Welling, that was terrific. I'm wondering if we have an update from Dr. Buchanan. We have a, we have a question in the chat. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, you what? yes, we do. Would you be able to show an example of something that is not symmetric? Yeah, uh, I think in, in the presentation, we'll have some examples. We'll kind of go through this in a little bit more detail. Um, so I was going to try to share my screen, but it, it said that the host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah. So, uh, Marcel, if you could make her a co-host again, please, that would be helpful. Okay. Done. All right. Let's try it again, Dr. Buchanan. Yeah. Aha. Yeah. 
Yay. I, I called my husband. I was like, I'm freaking out. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> and he was actually helpful. He was. He like Googled it and he was like, calm down. It's okay. <laughs> um, okay. So we'll go ahead and get started. Sorry about that, guys. Um, okay. So I'm going to be speaking today on the two step algorithm. Um, most of these images are from Dr. Rabinovitz. Um, and as well as most of the presentation, I'm just the lucky one who gets to talk to you guys about this algorithm today, okay? Okay, so first things first. So whenever we have a skin lesion, we're going to try to decide if it's melanocytic or non-melanocytic. Once we decide if something is melanocytic, then we're going to move on to try and decide if it's benign and we could reassure or monitor or if it's malignant and would potentially need a biopsy. And so we use different algorithms and patterns to kind of help us make this decision. And then if we go back to the first step, if we decide it's non-melanocytic, then we have multiple different types of non-malignant and malignant skin lesions and it can fit into some of those categories. So our first step is to decide, is the lesion a melanocytic neoplasm? And so typically, as Dr. Walling was just discussing, we decide this based on these features. So if something has a network, globules, streaks, or has a homogeneous pattern, and there's also different patterns that appear on acral surfaces, so the palms and the soles, and also there's a different pattern that appears on the face. We won't have time today to go in much detail with the acral and facial patterns, but we definitely will at a later date. So these are just some examples of what we were just discussing. So at the top left, you can see a pigment network and once you start to get comfortable with dermoscopy, you'll start to understand what these features represent histologically. So for example, with a pigment network, you see these multiple um, holes and that corresponds to the dermal papilla. And you see the thin sort of evenly spaced lines and that's due to how the melanocytes and the pigmented keratinocytes are, are arranged at the dermal epidermal junction. You can also see globules as part of a melanocytic neoplasm, streaks, and also a homogeneous blue or sometimes homogeneous tan color. And so these are all examples of a benign pattern. This is a pattern that we see on the palms and soles. Like I said, we'll go through this at a later date, but for example, this is the parallel furrow pattern, which is usually seen with the nevus. In contrast to that to an acral melanoma, which often has a parallel ridge pattern. And then because of how our hair follicles and sebaceous glands are arranged on the face, this has a little bit of a different pattern. It's called a pseudo network or an annular pattern. And so there's actually different criteria in, to diagnose, for example, a facial melanoma compared to a melanoma in other sites. And we'll also go through that at a later date. So once you've kind of made your decision that your skin lesion is likely melanocytic, then we have to go in and determine whether something is benign or malignant. And we do that based on pattern recognition. And so as Dr. Walling was talking about, we just kind of an overview I want you, to, you guys to think about this in terms of color, symmetry, and organization. And these are things that we do every day. We look at patterns in everyday life. So it can be easy for us to kind of pick up on a pattern just because it's something that we do routinely. So for example, you, you might not really know what you're looking at with this lesion, but you can see that it you know, looks like it has a benign pattern. It has, you know, few colors. 
the most common colors being light brown, dark brown, and black. Compare that to the picture on the, the bottom corner, which has multiple colors um, and other features that would be concerning. And as we were just talking about with symmetry and asymmetry, so whenever we talk about symmetry and asymmetry, we're talking about this in terms of the pattern, not necessarily the shape, okay? And so the asymmetry refers to the distribution of colors and structures on either side of the axis so that there's no mirror image. So these are just some examples. So most of the time, a benign lesion is gonna have is going to be symmetric on both axes. And a malignant lesion would tend to be asymmetric on both axes or perhaps asymmetric on one axis. And this is just a schematic here to show that. And so this is kind of another example. So you look at the photo on the left and it has a symmetric oval shape, but you can see that the patterns are different. So dermoscopically, that's going to be asymmetric. And then on the right, you can see the pattern is very symmetric, but the shape is asymmetric. So typically we say pattern trumps the shape, okay? And these are just some more examples. So again, you can see in this, you know, probably likely congenital melanistic nevus, you have a symmetric pattern, even though the shape is slightly atypical or asymmetric. And then on the bottom, you have a very round, you know, shape that's symmetric. Dermoscopically, however, it's asymmetric. There's, you know, more pigment at the top. You have some radial streaks. So that would be more concerning. And then organization versus disorganization. So, you know, you don't even have to really know what you're looking at in the top photos, but it looks organized. You know, it's, it's symmetric. It has a few colors and it's organi an organized pattern compared to the photos at the bottom where, you know, the pigment is distributed asymmetrically. You have multiple colors and overall sort of disorganized pattern or non-uniform pattern. Okay. So I'm just gonna go through a few examples of some benign nevus patterns. Again, this is actually gonna be the subject of our next talk. Um, so we'll go through that in more detail, but this is just to kind of give you a little bit more background. So these are 10 patterns that we can see with benign nevi. So whenever we're, you know, kind of making that first step, these are all melanocytic, and then these are all going to be features of benign nevi. So you can have multiple different patterns, and the reason for these multiple patterns has to do with the age of the patient, the Fitzpatrick skin type of the patient, and also the location. And we'll review that in detail um, at a later date. So here you have your clinical photos. Dermoscopically, you see this beautiful diffuse reticular um, network, okay? So these are all benign. And then this is an example of the um, peripheral reticular pattern with central hyperpigmentation. More examples here. This is a um, homogenous pattern. You can often see this pattern with a blue nevus. Um, and these are melanocytic. So, you know, the reason that this is blue kind of has to do with the way the light reflects. So, you know, it's still in the melanocytic category. It just so happens that the melanocytes are at a deeper level under the skin, and that reflects as blue light due to the Tyndall effect. And these are all benign. And so, like I said, we'll spend more time going through the different types of nevi at a later date. And so if you're looking at a lesion and it doesn't fall into one of the benign patterns, then we would be thinking, is this a melanoma? Okay. And again, we're, we're looking through it through the same lens. So you would strongly consider melanoma if you have multiple colors if your lesion is asymmetric and if it has a disorganized pattern. 
So I just want to kind of bring this to everyone's attention. We will go through these criteria um, at another date, but specifically to diagnose melanoma with dermoscopy, you're looking for these atypical features. So atypical pigment network, angulated lines, a negative network, atypical streaks. Um, you can have blue-white veil, atypical blotch, regression structures, peripheral tan structureless area, shiny white structures, and atypical vascular structures. So, you know, once you determine that something has an irregular color, if it's disorganized, um, and if it's asymmetric, then you'll start looking for these specific structures that, you know, are, you know, sensitive and specific for a melanoma. And if it has any one of the 10 or 11 specific structures, you want to view that more carefully, and it may prompt you to want to do a biopsy. These are some common malignant patterns that you can see. Um, this is an example of a reticular pattern, but as you can see, compared to the diffuse reticular pattern of a benign nevus, you have some thickening of the network at the periphery. You have some structureless areas, multiple colors. Similarly, you can see that with, these are all melanomas. So very asymmetric, um, thickened reticular lines. You can see some abnormal vasculature. This is a, again, a globular pattern that's disorganized. So we would be more concerned about this pattern than if we saw a nevus that had uniform globules distributed. No obvious network here, but you see multiple colors. Just some more examples. So essentially you kind of break it down. If you determine that it's a benign pattern, you can usually reassure the patient or you can kind of maybe see them back in three to six months, depending on um, your concern there. And if it's a malignant lesion, then you're likely gonna need to do um, some type of biopsy, okay? So once you've kind of, if you're still at the first step and you decide that this is not a melanocytic lesion, and sometimes that first step can be the hardest step, um, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about other non-melanocytic lesions in this next part to kind of help you make that decision. But if you determine that it's non-melanocytic, then you want to start the process of looking for additional patterns that can help you make the diagnosis. And these are typical lesions that we have um, good examples of pattern recognition for. So dermatofibroma, basal cell carcinoma, seborrheic keratosis, lentigo, lichen planus like keratosis, and hemangioma. So we're just going to briefly just kind of run through a few examples of each, okay? I know we still have one more case to do, so I don't want to take up too much time. This is a classic pattern seen with dermatofibromas, this uh, ring-like network pattern, which is the one exception that we have to a network being a melanocytic lesion. So you can see a peripheral network with dermatofibromas, which is why you wanna use your, your clinical, your physical exam to kind of help you make this diagnosis, okay? That dimple sign is pretty classic for a dermatofibroma. These are other patterns. So dermatofibromas, not always easy. Um, they can have multiple different patterns. These are uh, actually two of my patients that I saw um, about a month ago, and both of these cases came back as dermatofibromas, so they can be extremely challenging. And these are just a few photos kind of highlighting um, this sort of classic pattern that you see with dermatofibromas. And, you know, just to point out, these will look different in darker skin types. So oftentimes in a darker skin type, you may have a more kind of structureless area. That's when you kind of have to rely on the patient and their history a little bit more. Basal cell carcinomas, um, I love looking at these with dermoscopy. They have probably the most unique features, um, as you can see here. Um, blue ovoid nests, multiple 
gray blue globules, leaf like areas, spokal areas, arborizing vessels, which is the classic teaching. You can also see ulceration and shiny white areas. This is kind of a schematic of that. And then, you know, so I, I think the challenge with dermoscopy at first is you could look at this and you could say, oh, there's pigment. Well, this is a melanocytic lesion. But once you start to understand these patterns, you'll realize the structures that, you know, are usually seen together. And you'll, you'll start to even improve your clinical diagnosis um, once you have a good understanding of dermoscopy. And this is another example. So you see these multiple globules and so that might make you think, oh, is this a, you know, congenital nevus or is this a globular pattern? But on closer inspection, you can see these um, arborizing vessels and you can see how in focus these globules are. And so these are features that are more characteristically seen with a basal cell. And just some more examples. Severy keratosis. So these have very classic patterns as well. Um, typically, milia like cyst, comedo like openings, fissures and ridges, fingerprint like areas, twisted loop or hairpin vessels, and moth eaten borders. And so here we go again. Now I can totally understand looking at this, um, it looks, you know, a little asymmetric, but it's well demarcated. And you see classic features that you see with seborrheic keratosis. So again, once you start to kind of recognize these um, characteristic structures and features that you see with these benign lesions, it, it's going to make this a lot easier. And these are just some more examples. Coming to like openings and what it will look like on path. And then multiple milia like cysts. In some cases, if you have the ability to toggle between polarized and non-polarized light, it can help you, but you can still detect most of these features with polarized light, even though the non-polarized light does kind of help see the milia-like cyst a little bit better. Ridges and fissures. So the ridges are the raised areas, and then the fissures are sort of these keratin invaginations. Solar lentigo, very similar. Um, Fingerprint-like areas, moth-eaten borders, diffuse light brown structuralist areas. So again, this has sort of a classic fingerprint pattern with these fine lines that are in a parallel distribution, evenly spaced. And just a few more examples. And the, the scalloped border, um, that's definitely something to look out for too. And sometimes these will be structureless, um, but again, very sharp borders, uniform color distribution. Um, lichen planus like keratosis. So this is often called the great mimicker and it depends on when you catch it. So that, that's the reason for the multiple different patterns, but usually we see the kind of focal or diffuse gray dots granules pattern. Um, and this is an example of that. And so basically a lichen planus like keratosis is a solar lentigo or a seborrheic keratosis that's undergoing regression. So they can have features of a seborrheic keratosis and a solar lentigo, as well as these kind of diffuse gray dots granules that are usually represented of a neoplasm undergoing regression. Um, this, I kind of like to call it the half and half sign. You have half of it is a solar lentigo and half of it is kind of like the area that's undergoing regression. So this would be considered a lichen planus like keratosis. And there's other features that you can see with lichen planus like keratosis. Um, you can see multiple vessels as dots. Um, that's not as common. And we, we can go through that in more detail. And then vascular lesions. Um, these are usually pretty easy to diagnose, but I would encourage you to look at hemangiomas with your dermatoscope. Usually you see these kind of reddish blue clods um, or globules separated um, into like lacunae. Okay, so we're almost done guys. So, um, and if you need me to stop, I can. But uh, the last thing you want to do, if it doesn't have any of those features, then you want to search for any vascular structures or patterns. So vessels are usually monomorphous or polymorphous. Polymorphous means more than one set of vessels. So typically you would see linear or regular vessels, 
um, as well as vessels as dots. And the reason this is important is because you will not always be able to identify if something is melanocytic or non-melanocytic. You really do have to get an appreciation for the vascular structures. These are just some examples. We won't go through these in a lot of detail today, but the types of vessels as well as the arrangement of vessels is really important to um, evaluate the skin lesion. This is just an example, vessels as dots, um, typically seen with a squamous cell carcinoma in situ, but can be seen with various other patterns. And this is an example of a squamous cell that has this glomerular vessels or vessels as coils, kind of named after how it appears in the kidney. Okay. Um, and so then if you get to the point where it's featureless or structureless, then you're kind of back to where you started considering either monitoring or a biopsy or perhaps another diagnostic technique such as um, con confocal imaging. And I just want to point out there's an app so you can download it on your phone, the dermoscopy two-step algorithm. You can go through this two-step algorithm and it can really helpful, help you. They have lots of charts and things like that. Um, I had a case that we could go through, but I think Dr. Walling already did a great job of going through that case. So I'll save that for today um, and I'll let Jeremy go ahead and um, do his case unless there's any questions. I don't see anything new in the chat. Thank you. That was very, very uh, detailed and, and comprehensive presentation, Dr. Buchanan, so that we can get Dr. Greer in. Let's just jump straight into that. Jeremy, are you ready? Yes, sir, I am. So I believe uh, Rhea will click through the slides for me on her end. Um, but my case will pair well with this. I know Dr. Whaling did a melanocytic neoplasm and not mine is uh, the opposite. So you can kind of go down the other end of the algorithm here. Um, again, I'm Jeremy Greer. I'm a uh, senior resident graduating here, um, you know, in a couple of weeks from MCG. Uh, I've really enjoyed working on the project with all of you guys and uh, awesome to see how it's grown and uh, finally being able to be implemented both, you know, clinically and through this forum. Um, so again, thanks for letting me talk uh, one last time before I move on. Um, but we will go ahead and get started on this case here so we can finish up on time. So uh, next slide. So we had an 87 year old Caucasian male uh, with a history of Newman for this time. had no clue how long it had been there. Um, and as you can see, uh, clinically, there's, you know, a, a minefield of other areas as well. Definitely sun damaged. Uh, his left ear, mid neck, left upper neck also have similar appearing lesions. Uh, but the most concerning for him was this larger lesion uh, on that left, um, almost over the trap muscle there. Um, up on the closer view on the right, you can see um, it's a very, you know, asymmetric and shape lesion um, with kind of a, an almost a more pearly raised papule on the top. Uh, with more of a pink white plaque with an erosion in the lower half. Uh, next slide. Uh, so dermoscopically, um, as you can see here, you know, we go down our two-step algorithm. We don't have a uh, network. We don't have any globules. We don't have any homogeneous glue. Um, so this goes down our non-melanocytic pathway. Um, so, you know, we look at uh, what features we see here and it is asymmetric in pattern. So uh, the top half, if you'll hit the next slide for me here, uh, bottom half here, we'll start with that, does have um, some of those vessels we talked about uh, in Kendall's presentation where you have these glomerular or coiled vessels in the bottom left. Um, we have some shiny white structures on the right middle, um, you know, where you just have these white lines and white areas um, all throughout this lesion. Uh, next slide, please. And on the top, you see within the circle um, a totally different pattern. You have some arborizing vessels um, in this shiny white red structuralist area. Um, so this was, uh, you know, an unusual lesion where you have um, very specific findings for certain neoplasms, um, but two different neoplasms located all within the same lesion. Um, so if you have the next slide for me here, um, clinically what we saw and dermoscopically we saw on that top half of the lesion where we had more of that pearly raised papule, um, we do see the, the, you know, white red area with arborizing vessels seen with basal cell carcinoma. Uh, and the remainder of the lesion uh, was consistent with squamous cell carcinoma in situ, um, or Bowen's disease in this case, where you have these shiny white structures and glomerular vessels uh, really throughout with some areas of erosion. Uh, and there was also a scale uh, that was difficult to appreciate dermoscopically, but was there as well. So um, next slide. 
Um, so we did perform a biopsy of this lesion. Um, I believe you all have, you know, at least seen shade biopsies, may have done some yourself, um, but all it takes is, uh, you know, numb the area with 1% lidocaine, take a razor blade um, and do a little tangential shave biopsy uh, where you remove the lesion, uh, it's intrapathology. So the next slide, we have our pathology findings here. Um, next slide. Where we can see this kind of collision of a neoplasm. So in the bottom right, you see um, these clusters of blue with peripheral clefting um, where that is consistent with a nodular basal cell carcinoma. And the remainder of the lesion, you can see some atypia uh, of the epidermis um, all consistent with squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Um, so we did have both of these lesions um, dermoscopically, uh, clinically, and pathologically um, through our histo lab as well. Uh, next slide. So in conclusion, we did uh, refer this case for Mohs surgery uh, due to the indistinct margins and the size being greater than two centimeters. Uh, it's great, at least for us, to have a Mohs surgeon, uh, you know, accessible for us. Um, this could be excised as well, um, you know, if you had a, a surgeon able to do that for you. Uh, but most surgery can also be done for this size neoplasm. Uh, and then on our next slide, I have a couple questions uh, for the expert teams. So for one, I chose this case because it highlights uh, features of two different neoplasms, both basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Um, I won't make you answer the second question, uh, Dr. Buchanan, because he already talked about the features of seborrheic keratoses, uh, but just a kind of a more practical question for um, advice for everyone who's taking these images. When you have a very scaly lesion, it's hard to appreciate dermoscopically. Do you have any tips for how you might be able to see kind of beyond the scale to the remainder of the lesion? We're down to about two minutes. So if somebody's got a quick response to that. When I read that, I thought you were talking about the scale, like the micrometer scale, but you're talking about- No, no, no. Lesion. So I mean, uh, any scaliness of the neoplasm that sure. um, where it's hard to appreciate the blood vessels or structures below. Um, any of the experts can be Dr. Davis, Rabinovitz, or whoever. So apply the... Dr. Davis? I was going to say apply a lot of alcohol. Okay. The other thing that you can use is gel. That is, you can use ultrasound gel. And by uh, putting the ultrasound gel, it sometimes allows some of the scale to be a little more visible and see some of the vascular underneath. But it's difficult. Once you have a thick scale, um, it's very, very difficult to see the underlying structures. So you have to look aside from the areas where the scaling is. In terms of distinguishing a squamous cell carcinoma from an inflamed silvery keratosis, at least dermoscopically, usually with inflamed silvery keratosis, which you'll see are a different type of pattern of vasculature. The vessels, instead of being other dots or coils, are twisted loop or so-called hairpin vessels. Uh, but sometimes it's tough, and these are biopsy diagnoses. Great, right, that's helpful. Great. Well, I'm going to be the time um, controller here, and we're at time, and uh, I, I hate cutting off conversation and questions. Uh, please, if, if, you're, if you still have questions and we don't have time uh, out of respect for everyone else, please put them in the chat or email them to us. You'll see the CME information popping up in the chat right now. I don't know if we have a slide for that also but it's in the chat, you can copy that. Um, and of course, uh, we'll, we are grateful for everything. Uh, Dr. Buchanan, we're grateful for your uh, presentation today. Sorry you had a little technical difficulty, but grateful your husband could uh, jump in and, and, and help us out. Dr. Whaling, thanks for presenting. Thanks for being willing and able to jump in uh, at a moment's notice. Uh, Rhea, do you have other things we need to close out with? Uh, just a couple, uh, just a couple things. Um, message to the uh, well. Let's go for the the next session uh, is going to be on July 11th. The first Monday of the month is the Fourth of July, and hopefully everyone's going to be out um, doing fireworks or picnics or whatever. So um, we will meet on the second Monday of July. Hopefully that will work for everyone. Uh, Dr. Buchanan will speak on patterns of nevi. Uh, Ms. Lori Hutchins from uh, one of our clinics, Mount Vernon, will do one case presentation. We're looking for another case presentation. So uh, anyone from our clinics uh, would like to volunteer, please let me know. And uh, one message also to our clinics. Periodically, we uh, email you surveys. Uh, or uh, right after right after our clinics to um, see how um, 
how things are going. Um, I urge you to really, when you get that email, to open the email and click to take the survey. It is less than five minutes. It's just a few questions, but it is important uh, for us. And at any time, if anyone wants to have particular topics covered, also please let us know. And um, I want to thank again, everyone we have, uh, including all the group in family medicine, we've got well over, I believe well over 30 people attending today, which is just great. So I'm very happy uh, to, to see you all. And now if the uh, Telederm Hub people can stay on for a few minutes of wrap up, uh, the rest of um, the uh, clinic and folks and guests, uh, you can all uh, sign off now. And best wishes for the rest of the week and a good summer and see you in July. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, that's okay. 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 You stopped the call. What? I stopped the call. Oh. And you saved the chat. Yeah, I have it saved.